Hey there, everybody, and welcome back to the Growing Band Director podcast. My name is Kyle Smith, and joining me is my friend and colleague, Jeff Smith. Our mission is to share practical advice and explore topics that will help every band director, no matter your experience level, as well as music education students who are working to join us in the coming years. Together, we will discuss many aspects of a well-rounded band program, but most importantly, we will discuss concepts that help us all improve our own programs each and every day. Always remember the famous quote by Ray Kroc, when you're green, you're growing, and when you're right, you rot. Let's get started. Welcome back, everybody, to the Growing Band Director podcast. This is episode number 67. Ansby Rose, how are you? I'm good. Great. Great to be here with you, Kyle. Thank you. So Ansby is um, Associate Professor and Director of Instrumental Activities at Dort University in Iowa. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, um, I've I've had a, a very uh, colorful background, honestly. To to be concise, I, you know, I graduated high school, went to school for music ed, joined the United States Marine Corps, planning to only do four years, ended up doing eleven. Um, got out, did a, some other things. I actually I kid with my students all the time and tell them I've I've always been a conductor, but for five years I was a conductor of a different type. I actually was a freight conductor on the railroad. Um, anyway, right. got back into uh, got back into teaching in uh, 2012 after my first wife passed, and uh, after teaching public school for a few years, decided that I wanted to go back to school. Did my master's and doctorate back to back. Graduated from Ohio State in 2019, and uh, pretty much the day after I picked up my diploma, my wife and my uh, five boys and I uh, got in our van and moved to Iowa, and I've been here happily ever since. So five boys. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My wife bears the brunt of that. So I, I have to give her the credit. Wow. Amazing. So I wanted to start with, uh, I was just looking at a Facebook post that you had about a consortium that you led. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Yeah. So composer is Grace Dunlap and mm-hmm. um, the piece is entitled When I Consider the Heavens. And it was really touching to me um, would you mind if I just read your post or would you like to speak about it? Instead? No, that, that would be fine. I think that describes it well. Okay. So here we go. Last fall and leading into this semester, I and the Dort Wind Symphony led a consortium to commission composer Grace Bauger Dunlap to write a new work for wind band. We recently received this music and began preparation. The music she wrote is incredible, inspired by Psalm 8. The title of the new work is When I Consider the Heavens. During our rehearsal today, I was able to do all I w- sorry, it was all I was able to do to fight back tears as we worked on the beginning first uh, third of this wonderful music. It is truly a beautiful work written by a wonderful composer. Once the work is published, I encourage everyone to purchase it and play it. You will not be sorry. Maybe I'm biased because we are the lead commissioner, but it is so absolutely and emotionally amazing. And here's the phrase from Psalms 8 that it is from. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens through the praise of children and infants. You have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moons and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings, and you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And that was very touching. Um, So can you give us a little background about how this came about? Yeah, so um, this would have been in around the end of 2018, 2019. Um, I had just uh, shortly before that composed my symphony number one. And uh, Frank Trace from Kansas State University had me out for a week-long composer residency. Um, while I was there, Grace, I think was, if I remember correctly, was finishing up her master's in composition and uh, got to meet her, spend some time with not only her, but, but the bands there at Kansas State. Uh, um, uh, Alex uh, Wimmer also did uh, a work of mine with his band. And uh, we just, you know, uh, developed a friendship. And then uh, after I landed here at Dort, um, one of the things that that uh, Grace and I talked about and that we've continued to talk about is we, we both are very um, um, devout with our faith. Um, our, As am I. Uh, right. 
So, uh, you know, that was, that was a nice connection to make that there. And then, of course, uh, the listeners may or may not know, Dort is a Christian university. And uh, the more that I thought about it, the more that I thought, you know, she would be an ideal person to write something new um, for us to perform and to record. And so I reached out to her. This was probably about a year or so ago. And uh, we talked and I said, you know what, I've, I've luckily got a pretty solid group here. I've got full double reads. I've got full instrumentation, all the contra instruments. I want you to write us something that, you know, you don't have any limitations on. Um, and, and she did a great job of that. It's very playable. I would probably put it in the grade four, four and a half range. Okay. Um, so it's, you know, it's playable by a good high school band. Um, but the harmonies and Grace's voice as a composer is very unique in my opinion. It's uh, the way that she orchestrates, the way that she writes is is different than other composers writing right now, which I love. That's that's great to have something new. So yeah, we literally just got the parts on Monday. I was able to print them out and put them in front of the students on Tuesday, and we've begun rehearsals on it, and things are already taken off. I had numerous students come up to me after rehearsal on Tuesday and say this is one of the most beautiful pieces that I've ever played. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to sharing it with um, not only our community here in Sioux Center, but uh, we'll be playing it at all of our performances while we're on tour, uh, March 4th through 14th, as well as recording it for our new album. How long have you had the score to do your preparations and all that? <laughs> not very long. That was one of the challenges. You know, as a conductor, we always want to get those scores and dig into them and spend hours Okay. Um, I mean, I got the score on Monday and I did spend some time with it uh, Monday evening and during the day on Tuesday. And then we started preparations on, on Tuesday at rehearsals. Wow. So, so I'm still in the score study process for sure. Yeah. One thing that I have as it is an advantage of a, t of a teacher of younger students is so often on the simpler music, if you just follow the low brass parts, you can easily figure out the <laughs> harmonies. But the harder the pieces get, you're like, ah, I can't do that all the right. time. For people who are listening who are like middle school teachers or whatever, if everybody's playing, just look at the low brass. You can easily figure out the chords real fast. <laughs> You're exactly right. Yeah, there's there's definitely some tricks to it. And, and, you know, Grace was kind enough to send me a MIDI mock-up of it. So mm -hmm. I don't normally take recordings and listen to them in order to study scores. But when it's a pinch and I just want to make sure that I can guide the ensemble as we begin rehearsal, then it was nice to have that. Okay, so I'm excited to have you on because you you present a clinic called Programming, sorry, Concert Programming with Success, mm -hmm. Old, New, Borrowed, Blue, and a March. And you, you've done this in the past and, and in the future. And it really home for me, so that's why I was really excited to be able to connect with you. One right. of my mentors, when I first started teaching, had a phrase he told me that said, 90% of success occurs before the first note of the first rehearsal. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that speaks to knowing your students, choosing quality literature that is a good fit for them. And mm -hmm. if you've done your preparation, then they will be successful. 90% right. of the time when there is failure, it's the teacher's fault, not the student's fault. Correct. Yeah, we, we really have to be, you know, the, the music that we play, the music that we put in front of our students, is it's, what we do is unique in the way that we don't have a textbook per se. The music that we choose to place on their stands is the textbook. Um, so just like any other subject, math, English, whatever it might be, those teachers are very um, picky about the textbooks that they use, and rightfully so, and we should be just as picky about the music that we place in front of our musicians. I do want to say, uh, we haven't talked about this, I, I keep a pretty extensive list. It's a pretty messy list, but a list of things that I like that I'm using to throw in this concert and not that concert and, and all that. Right. Um, I have put on for people who are Patreon members, and thank you for those of you who have started to sign up recently. Um, they're uh, in the folder for episode 67. I have put that list as well as some other things that um, Dr. Rose has for us for people to awesome. be able to scour through. Like, for example, in one of my groups coming up, I'm proud because we're doing four pieces. Um, the composers are Boysen, Granger, Holst, and Bernstein. And it's like, awesome. yes, there's a winner, you know? Yeah, um, absolutely. But what I struggle with, as I'm sure a lot of students, uh, sorry, teachers do, is sifting through the new music, mm -hmm. right? That's so hard because there's so much new music that I don't really want to touch. Right. But I know there's great music by this composer you're talking about, and, and I can't wait to learn this piece and hopefully buy it and do it as well. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have advice besides listen a lot and figure out what you like? Yeah, I mean, that's that's obviously the first step. I think all of us as as conductor teachers, um, especially in the wind band medium, you know, the wind band has, especially in the last 15 years or so, 
the wind band has has developed to where that we are essentially kind of a new music ensemble. Um, it, it's one of the great things about our profession is that we as conductors and our students, and I'm finding that our audiences too, crave new music, which is mm-hmm. awesome. Um, there, there are other settings that we could be in that that's not necessarily the case. Um, so yeah, the, I mean, the first step is listening and things. The other step is uh, doing your research, um, going to conferences. I think uh, probably my top choice, I tell my students this all the time, that if I can only go to one conference every year, and that it's, I can only go to one, then I go to Midwest. Mm-hmm. Um, Midwest is obviously centered around new, newly published band and orchestra works, and you can really get a good idea of the stuff that's available there. Um, and even if you don't go, you can hop on the website and the performing programs are there so you can look and see what's being played. That's where I learned about uh, composers that I hadn't been exposed to yet, like Kevin Day. Um, I already knew Grace, but but uh, Nicole Puino, she was another one that I was exposed to and, and uh, got to know her at, uh, through Midwest. And that's probably my biggest step. Um, the other one is, is there's, you know, this great website, windrep.org, that mm-hmm. uh, was developed by, I think, Nick Plato. And uh, there's a number of others that have really kept that site updated. Um, I go there and look around a lot, and I force myself to click on names that I don't recognize mm-hmm. and say, okay, what has this person written? And then I'll go, and if they have the ability for me to listen to a MIDI or listen to a performance, um, then I'll start Listening. We can't possibly listen to all of the music that's out there, um, especially now because there's so much being published and publishing has gotten so much easier for self-publication and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. But we can uh, force ourselves to go outside of our box. And it's like anything else in life. If you just stick with what you know, then you'll never expand that horizon. But even if you only learn a couple new composers per year, and maybe you play one of their pieces, then you can continue to expand that box to choose from, and that will lead you to other things also. You were mentioning Midwest. I think a lot of teachers won't go and see performances of high-level groups because they say, well, the, the music is great, but my kids aren't going to play that. Well, what's great about Midwest is all the different varied levels, right? right. Um, and I mean, I, I don't agree with that. I think you should listen right. to high-level music no matter what, but... There's two, there's two pieces I remember hearing from Michigan State University, I forget the year, 2013 or 14, that within mm-hmm. a couple of years I used with my band. One was, uh, oh shoot, Kevin Putt's Charm, which is a great oh, yeah. piece. Um, and then a piece by Scott McAllister, Gone. You know, okay. those are both like just such wonderful pieces that yeah. you're hearing amazing groups, but you go, oh my gosh, I'm hearing this piece. My kids could do this piece. Well, you know, one of the things that I have noticed, and I fell into this trap when I was teaching secondary school, and thankfully my mentors, specifically uh, for, for this specific um, area of, of thought of mine, my, my mentor when I was in my master's at Appalachian State, Dr. John Ross, he's the director of bands there, he pushed me to, to not limit myself as a band director. Um, I think all too often as middle school, high school, as well as collegiate level band directors, we we hold ourselves back by thinking, oh, my, my, my band can't do that. That's too hard. And there, there's some truth to that sometimes, but our bands can do far more than what we think they can do. My group here, I have 64 players in my premier band. Only three of them are music majors. And we play some of the hardest literature that's out there. And is it perfect? Does it sound like um, you know, the te- Texas at Austin or sound like, you know, Northwestern University. No, we're not at that level quite yet, but, but we do a really respectable job of it. And the exposure to those types of pieces are important for our students. Even if it's not note perfect, if we can do it to a good level, that exposure I think is incredibly important. That's why um, all the research is so important because you want to plan for their growth. Don't plan for what they are now, plan for what they're going to be. Absolutely. But you, but you also need to know where your kids are at. I mean, because we've all seen those bands where they're playing two grade levels higher than they should. Right. And that's just called over programming. And that isn't fun. But nope. I, every, I think uh, every teacher gets that feeling when you're re- working on a piece that you've over programmed mm-hmm. and you're on the second rehearsal or first rehearsal. If you have that gut feeling that says, this is not fun, this might be too hard, just, right. just abort and, and find and something. I've done that a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean that happens. We all make mistakes, but the you know a good conductor teacher um, has a good idea of what is possible, and what's possible usually is more than what the kids 
think is possible because mm-hmm. they will limit themselves drastically as well. Mm-hmm. But then our job is to show them that, no, you can do more than what you think you can. I'll never forget here at Dort, two years ago, I programmed uh, David Maslenka's Fourth Symphony. Mm, great. And when I put it on the stands the first day and we got ready to read it the first time, my band looked at me like I had 10 heads. But by gollies, by the time we gave the concert, it was a respectable performance. Again, not note perfect. I wouldn't send that recording in to apply to play at a conference or anything. But it was an incredibly emotional performance. They played it well, and they grew tremendously from it. I remember, I don't remember the year that came out, but I remember being in grad school in 2003, two, and that was a pretty new piece, I think. Mm -hmm. And we played it. And I remember turning to the last page and just laughing. Of the, of the trumpet part, because it was like, we're still playing up here. And, and right. you know, the end of that is such a blow. Um, it's just yeah. a, such a great religious work that really hit me on a spiritual level as well. Yeah, it's really incredible. I, you know, I'm very lucky that I got to become uh, quite good friends with David before his death and, uh, you know, learn about all of his thoughts about stuff like that. It is it's a wonderful piece of music. Probably my number one piece if I had to choose one. Yeah, it's so great. It's so great. Yeah, so my partner who does the podcast with me, Jeff, um, he... He always talks about the students' growth. Like, don't just program where they're at. Program where they can grow to. Absolutely. Um, so I'm really glad we got to hit that. Um, so let's let's go into a little bit about the way you would present if we were at a at a conference. Sure, sure. Uh, so old, new, borrowed, blue, and a march. Um, I have it in front of me. I know you're not going to just go through it like we were live, but but right. what are you know? Let's talk about some of the key tenets of this and what yeah, your vision so- is. The first thing that I always explain to uh, you know conference attendees whenever I give this is that there's a thousand ways that we could choose to, to program, like to help guide our thoughts in programming. This is just one. Um, and I, honestly, I wish that I could totally take credit for it, but I actually, this was, was uh, offered to me in thought whenever I was in my master's degree by my good friend, uh, Kevin Richardson, who was the associate director of bands at Appalachian State at the time. And it was a little bit different than, than what, I, what I stated as, but it was generally kind of the, the framework there of, you know, these are five different categories that you can think about as far as ensuring that you don't program a concert that has too much of the same same. Um, all of us have our favorite composers. You know, if, if it were left up to me, I'd play concerts of all David Maslenka if I didn't <laughs> keep myself in check because I love his music. But that wouldn't be good for my audiences and it wouldn't be good for my education of my students. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the great thing about the wind band is that we have music that comes from so many different areas. So, for example, starting with something old, that could be a number of things. It could be... Uh, the, we're, we're preparing the Shostakovich Prelude Opus 34 right now, the Bob Reynolds transcription. Mm, so That's great. old, but it could also be um, borrowed because it was originally a piano prelude. That and, was- and that's a piece that, if you have a couple of the right kids, is totally playable at the high school level. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if you've got a screamer trumpet player to get that upper trumpet part, then you've got it. Contrabass uh, clarinet, it's like yep. the whole thing. And it's beautiful. It comes together relatively easy with a, with a solid uh, a solid ensemble. So that's kind of my thinking about old. Old can also, you know, be viewed as one one of my kind of measuring sticks for old is is the composer still alive or have they already passed on? Mm-hmm. So that's that. There's a lot of gray area in that because technically we could say, okay, well that makes David Maslenka's music old because he passed in 2017. But some of his stuff that he wrote right at the end of his life, I don't know that I consider that old or not. So it's you know that's up for debate and it could be different from person to person. But if I'm playing, say, a Claude T. Smith piece, mm-hmm. I would consider that especially for wind band old because the history is you know only a hundred or so years, um, and then. Before you go on, let's yeah. let's uh, the the composer that always comes to me is Bach. The, okay. amount, the amount of stuff that is out there for Bach, even at the high school level, oh, I mean, it's just yeah. it's just there's a reason Bach is Bach, and Absolutely. I you know especially if people are not fluent in this music, right? right. If they if they don't know a lot, you just go onto any site you can search and just put in Bach, choose the band yeah. filter, and just Bach. start listening. And talk about educational for your students. Mm-hmm. I mean. You, you can't do much better than that for the development of their, their tonal part of their hearing so that they can hear how chords work, how progressions work, intonation, uh, you know, just intonation throughout and things like that. It's, I mean, there's no better way to teach that. At the grade three level, the Bach prelude and fugue in B flat is, I mean, 
experienced teachers know it, but you could, you could rehearse that all year long. And I've actually yeah, found that absolutely. kids love that piece. If you're doing Bach, I would suggest writing out some, especially keyboard percussion stuff for mm -hmm. them to do that's respectable at their level that isn't going to ruin the intent of the music. We're not adding crashables and stuff, but um, right. more, more to do than just timpani. So I just had to put my Bach plug in there because he's so Yeah, great. no problem. I completely agree. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually currently, it's been a, kind of a long-term project of mine. I'm taking the Bach 371 chorales and, and just uh, arranging them for wind bands so that you have all of them. You know, we as conductors tend to be drawn towards those flat keys but mm -hmm. I think it's important that we put stuff in front of our kids that's out of their out of their realm in the sharp keys as well, and in all the different different things that he writes. And that's just a great teaching tool. Wonderful. Um, a lot of that stuff out there, but it'd be nice to have the whole thing, um, you know. And then uh, to balance out old, you've got new. Well, in our uh, profession, new is easy because we have just hordes of new music coming out for the wind band. Um, so that could be a number of different things, you know, in, in my, um, in my writing, I specifically highlight some co composers from most recently, Kevin Day, Julie Giroux, uh, John Mackey, Randall Stanbridge, um, you know, some of, I think some of Maslenka's stuff written, um, at the end of his life could still be classified as new, but you could also look at that in a different way. Maybe it's a new piano piece or a new organ piece that someone set for wind band. Mm -hmm. um, that's another way to look at new, but generally it's, you know, stuff in the last 20 years, you know, you would say, um, and there's just so much to choose from out there. So that kind of gets you through that category. And then the, the category that I like the most, usually when I'm programming, I keep these in mind. And as I'm going, I'll kind of plug them into what I think is what I call their, their primary classification. So, you know, I believe this piece is old, or I believe this piece is borrowed or whatever it might be primarily. And I always save something blue for last because it's such a flexible category. Um, you can play something blue and it not be slow. Uh, for example, just this past fall, we did uh, uh, Frank T. Kelly's Blue Shades here. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's blue. It's got blue in the title, but it's blue in, in various ways. Um, but you could also call Omanu Mysterium blue because that's a slow lyrical piece. So I usually save that in order to look back at all my other categories as to what I've programmed and decide, you know, what what can I put there to offer more balance against the things that I've already played? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, sl slow, something melancholy, maybe something in minor, even something that's just jazz could be considered your blue. Maybe you've got a slow piece somewhere else in the program that's in another primary classification area and you program a jazz tune here because that satisfies the blue and it helps balance out the other stuff on the program. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, finally, the, the last and I think the most important, and I'm, I'm, I'll get on my soapbox a little bit here, uh, I think it's unfortunate in our profession that many times some of our best ensembles across the nation, it seems have begun to stray away from playing marches. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's just the military musician in me or uh, just the fact that I, I just love marches. I love that genre. But I do my very best to make sure that I have a march on every concert. Um, I think it's important historically because we've got uh, you know such great writing of marches from years and years ago. I think that our students need to learn how to play in that style. It's a unique style that we can teach a lot of things through. Um, and I think that there's just a lot of great music out there. You know, the Marine Band has just recently um, uh, put out for free all of John Philip Sousa's marches. Mm -hmm. But you can download the scoring parts for free and you can play these in the style that the Marine Band has played them for 100 plus years. Um, with your own students. And I think that's a tremendous uh, area that we just need not let go away. Um, it's I think, I think one of the reasons that tends to happen is because if people think I only have, say, three concerts or whatever, and right. I'm, I'm only going to do three pieces, so if I, you know, I'm taking up a third of it with, with marches, uh, I, so I understand where they're coming from if that's their thought. I do, yeah. M my, my thought, and I put this with an exclamation point, we already talked about giving music for our students to grow in. Another concept that I like to do is there's also a lot of value in under-programming and doing more music. Instead of pushing to do three pieces, right. because at a, if you have like two or three bands at the high school, if you're doing six or seven pieces per band, the concerts last for like six days. Sure. So, so, you know, I'd much rather do five pieces that are mm -hmm. maybe grade three and one of them is a four 
Um, and I also try to do concerts every six weeks or so, so that there's just more. So now if you're mm -hmm. talking, okay, I want to do four marches this year and we have 20 to choose from, then there's way more opportunity for other things. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I tend to do the same thing. Even with my collegiate ensembles, I usually pick one, maybe two that are really going to push them. And then uh, the other things I know that we can prep relatively comfortably. And I know, you know, I, I'm a numbers guy. So every concert cycle, I sit down and count how many rehearsals that I have, how many minutes I have. I put that in an Excel file and, you know, I've got all these calculations that I do to make sure that I'm giving each, each piece it's due. Time. Well, and think, think of it from a, a kid's standpoint or a player's right. standpoint, right? Like, do you want to see five pieces that are impossible? Right. Or do you want to do you want to find stuff you can play music pretty well the first time, and then okay, Absolutely. I'll work on this one as long as I got these others that I know are in my wheelhouse. Absolutely, yeah, and and to also give them a sense of accomplishment on those pieces that aren't quite as hard, mm -hmm. um, so that you can really push them and and encourage them on the pieces that they do really have to work. And hard. they can sound really good, not just for their level. They can exactly. sound really good. Period. Period. Exactly. I mean, we've all so, heard those middle school bands that sound like professional bands. Right. Exactly. You know, like you can get your kids to sound great as long as the repertoire is right. And, and I'll be the first to admit, I mean, this is not a foolproof plan. There, I, I do concerts on occasion that don't include a march. For example, every year here at Dort, we do a huge, uh, we call it the Fall Music Festival, and it involves all five of our choirs and all three of my primary instrumental ensembles. And each of us can only play for about 15 minutes otherwise the concert is you know 18 hours long right i mean it, it still ends up being about a three and a half hour concert mm. we'll kind of come and go as they please we we tell them that that's okay because that's a long time to sit um but you know each group plays three pieces i typically don't program a march on that concert with with any of my groups because we don't have time to do that but the rest of my concerts, luckily here, I have three 75-minute rehearsals, which for a college group is, is pretty pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and I usually program somewhere between five and seven pieces and one of those as a march. But on occasion, I'll choose to do something like Mislanka 4. And when we played that, that was the only piece we played because mm -hmm. I needed all of my rehearsal time to prepare it. Mm -hmm. So, so lots of flexibility. I mean, and again, uh, as I mentioned, this is not a hard and fast rule. It's just something to help give us aid to be balanced. Um, you know, one of the things I always get asked at conferences, usually after the, after my presentation is over with is, you know, one of the big emphasis that we've got going on in the wind band world and really in the, in the instrumental music and just music performance world in general now is making sure that we're also programming music from areas of, of society that have been historically underrepresented. Mm -hmm. um, and I always get asked, you know, where's, where's your category for that? And I said, it's all of them. It's all of them. I could go through here and probably name pieces that I'm familiar with from underrepresented composers that can fall in any of those categories so I don't make a special category for that because that's always something that's in the back of my mind is, hey, I want to make sure that I play music uh, that, that is a good representation of not only the students that I have in the ensemble, but the audience members that are going to come to listen, as well as anyone that may uh, be looking at, at our programs and things like that so that we can be enriched by including all of those um, uh, composers of diversity. Um, so I, I don't want to, I think most of the time people, people ask me because they're afraid that I'm, I'm not thinking about that. I'm like, no, I just don't think it's its own category because it could fit in all of them. Agreed. Um, well, one other thing I wanted to mention that I've been doing for a long time is a lot of, a lot of teachers when they're programming, think about tempos. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a fast piece and then a slow piece and then a fast piece, right? Now that might be a march, a slow piece and a focus piece. And right. I can't, well, okay. So if you do... Circus B March, and um, then you do Ye Banks and Braze, Bonnie Dune, and then you do some like focus piece, say Longford Legend or something like, okay, that's, that's a great program. All right, that's an awesome program. But I think if you think more about mood rather than tempo, it opens you up to all these other things. And the, the reason I, I go to mood is because we're, de we're human beings, right? Last thing I checked, we're both human beings. <laughs> and our, 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 kids, our kids are obviously all human beings as well. So I love being able to do, okay, this, we have a piece that's pretty angry and a piece that is pretty light and playful and a piece that's all about love and a piece that it just dances. So I think if you think of it that way as well, and a march can fit into a lot of those different categories, depending on how you approach the march. Um, I think 
that is a way to program as well. And I've, I found a lot of success, whether it's three pieces or two pieces or five pieces or whatever. And it's, it's intuitive. I mean, a lot of what we do as musicians is not quantitative. We can't sit down and, like an engineer, plan out the structure of a program in that way. It sometimes is just a gut feeling of, okay, mm-hmm. these are the pieces that I think will go together. And then many times for me, I find that after I've, I've gone through and I've programmed like this, we start rehearsals and I'm still trying to figure out, you know, what order do we put these in? To provide the audience and the mm-hmm. musicians that that feeling of continuity throughout a concert, um, so that you ha- you feel that even though five six pieces whatever you play three pieces that they're they're totally disconnected really find them creating one organism of a concert together almost as if it would have had to have been those five pieces to make that work. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just kind of how I go about it. And, you know, a lot of people, I'm honestly not really into gut feelings myself, but I think sometimes in music is specifically that that's what we've got. We just have to trust our intuition that, okay, this is going to make a great experience for everyone involved. I, I've found that if uh, maybe three weeks before the concert, if I set a day to do a concert performance run through, no matter what, at a, you know, a 90% level or whatever, sometimes right. you go at the end, it's clear these two pieces need to switch. Sometimes right. when you, you listen to it, it's fine, but you actually perform it with the kids. Um, and it's, it's different. Um, I had a, a note here. Think about the students and which parts they're going to play mm-hmm. uh, as you're picking pieces. If it does not fit them or won't fit them, don't do the piece. It's That's so right. often we're like, this is such a great piece and my kids could play this, quote unquote. But can you think about like, what, can your clarinet players tongue that fast? <laughs> can right. they play over the break? I mean, heck, it, but it's all over the... so. Right. It, will it fit them with some right teaching or will it not fit them? That's why I've said before on other podcasts, um, Dale Perkins, one of my good friends, always has teachers come up and he suggests they look at the parts when they're looking through the piece, not just the score, because it shows you what the kids are looking at. Yeah. And that's that's, the, you know, I even tell my ensembles that that, you know, on the occasion that I've had to pull a piece, um, you know, I will explain it to them that you all can play this piece. It's just a matter of us having the time. So, you know, if you hand a sixth grade band a grade five piece, can they play it? They probably can in about four years. Yeah. You know, because you need that time to teach them pedagogically the, the skills that they need. But that's where, you know, it comes to our hopefully knowledge of, of, you know, the challenges that each of our students have as far as they're playing, that we can, like you said, look at those parts and know, okay, my clarinet's Probably couldn't play that right now, but I think within the rehearsal time that I have, I can get them to that point or they can't get to that point. So I need to avoid that and do something else. So I don't know if this is something you agree with at the collegiate level. Uh, We Mm -hmm. can have that discussion, but at the high school, middle school level, one of the things my wife and I try to do a lot is to plan ahead with our with our literature a good amount Mm -hmm. that gives us flexibility to change as the time gets closer or even you know, as we're doing it. So I try to program four or five concerts kind of ahead, giving us kind of a clear path. And uh, then we can change ahead of time. Now, maybe you can do that in public school where you kind of know who's coming and what. Right. I don't know. Is that the same at the collegiate level? Is that it something? Is. Yeah. Um, you know, part of that, I think, is just logistical for me and the fact that once the academic year starts in the fall, um, it's it's kind of like a, a, a horse race. Once that starting pistol's gone off, you just don't have time to look back. Mm-hmm. Um, so I often, usually what I do is throughout the year, I keep an Excel file with all of the literature that I've played with each of my ensembles. And then I've also, part of that Excel file is kind of the list like you were talking about before. Of these are pieces that I might like to play in the future. Whenever I'm a part of a consortium and I've gotten, you know, the score and parts, hey, this is a consortium piece. I want to make sure that I try to work this in in the next year or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as soon as school goes out in May, I start thinking about the next year. Um, yeah. I generally have at least a decent idea of who I'm going to have. Um, all of our scholarship auditions are done. The students have decided where they're going to go to school. So I'll know what my freshman class is going to look like. I'll know the seniors that I'm losing. And I'll have at least a decent idea. Auditions don't take place until the fall, but I have a good idea of what's possible. Um, So I program literally for the whole year with the exception of I leave my very last concert in May open 
until I get through the end of the fall semester, because then I have a really good idea of what the band is able to do. Yep. Um, and then if I find in the fall that the band is not as strong or is as stronger than I thought it was, then I can go in and start tweaking things. Mm-hmm. And then for that last concert, I've usually already got some ideas of what I want to do, but I'm waiting to find out kind of what the level is and where we're going to be at. Um, and then usually by December, I've got that May concert program. Um, and then I start the whole process over again in, in May. I guess I will say, I just, I want to advise because there are teachers who choose their programming based on the day before the first rehearsal, what is in the library. They literally walk through, oh, I like that one. I like that one. I like that one. Here we go. Right. And obviously I'm not trying to contribute malintent or anything, but you know, oh, being, no. being more and thoughtful and mm. a- approaching it differently helps a lot. I had a, um, a mentor one time who told me when you're choosing which of your pieces should end the concert, it doesn't always have to be the, the loudest piece. Sometimes it is, but right. the way he put it was um, put whatever piece last that can't be followed by anything else. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I mean, most often us as band directors and the wind band uh, community in general, you know, you start with something that kind of smacks you in the face and then, you know, you have your ups and downs throughout, and then you end with something that kind of, uh, you know, leaves you with a lot of energy or whatever. But it doesn't have to be that way. Um, you can close concerts on a soft piece, um, just as you said. It just has to work. You have to feel like intuitively that the concert lies well together and that mm-hmm. when the audience members leave, that they will have felt like they've just watched a good movie, you know, right. and fulfilled as well as the musicians. Of yeah, sometimes you have this really powerful end to a piece. And you're right. like, oh, wow, that's so cool. And then it's, bah, 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 da, da, da. it's like, <laughs> right. some, sometimes that's not the appropriate time to put it. I would agree with that. Yeah. I would agree. I, I had a couple pieces that have come to mind that I've sketched down that uh, one is a grade three, one's a grade five, at least in my estimation, that I've done before. And I'm sure you'll know mm-hmm. one at least, maybe both, um, that fit into multiple of your categories. I think they fit into old, new, uh, and borrowed. Maybe not new for this one anymore. Um, the first one is Tim Mars Endurance. Do you know that piece? Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're actually working on Tim Mars Suite for Band right now. Yeah. So if people don't know Tim Mars' music, it's so good. I've I've oh, met him a number good. of times. Um, he's the one who we had it at uh, when I was in college, and he's and I was trying to analyze the piece of music that he was writing, and I think it was Soaring Hawk, and he's mm-hmm. like, "Oh, that's just white key stuff." That was so it was so <laughs> classic. I was like, "Okay, that's all it is." So that's the shipwreck of uh, of the 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 endurance and and the book. Who's, okay. the, who's, who's the composer of the book? Um, I mean, the, the writer, I forget, but the piece mm-hmm. is called Endurance and it's this harrowing story of Sir Ernest Shackleton. And it's a great piece of music. If you have yeah. two, if you have like two all-state flute players and a, a very good piano player, it's a great piece of music. Yeah, Tim's um, music is, is, is incredible. And Tim is just a really great guy too. You know, he's only about four hours from us. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's always been very supportive of me since I've been here and welcome to answer questions and things like that. And, and the more that I listen and study his music, the more I love it. Yeah. And someone who's, a, who's been a composer, you know, and a For teacher a throughout. Time, yeah. Yeah. Um, the other one is at the grade three level, which is a Brian Balmage's piece called, called Within the Castle Walls. Okay. Um, I say this because to me, it reminds me of like a whole suite. Now I don't want to like commit blasphemy or anything, but it reminds me of a whole suite written 10 years ago. Okay. It takes, it takes four songs from the Welsh revolution mm-hmm. and it puts them in a wonderful setting. There's so much to teach with all the sections. There's enough percussion to go around. Um, and it's a wonderful piece of music within the castle walls. If people want to check that out, it's, it's so yeah. good. So you know, good. I, I don't think I've ever heard a piece of Brian's that isn't just so well-crafted and well-written. He, he is an incredibly gifted person, especially, and I mean, his hard stuff is awesome, but his, uh, his middle school, uh, you know, band stuff into lower level high school, grade two, three, four mm-hmm. is just, I don't think there's much of anybody better out there writing for, for wind band at that level now. It has a spirit about it. It really does, yeah. There's a couple that are coming to mind at the grade three level um, or four. Him in Celebration is one of them that mm-hmm. you think, okay, that's like a, but you listen to it and there's just, he, he just has a way of writing that I have not heard from anybody else. Yeah, it's else. very unique. He's got a great voice and he can still be incredibly artistic even at the grade two level, you know? So we did a commission with him in 2018. Oh, cool. For the 50th anniversary of the MLK assassination, and it uh-huh. was premier- it was premiered the next year at Midwest. Um, oh, wow! That's great. We, I mean, we were the 
we were not the performing ensemble at Midwest, but we had done it. It's called Etched in Stone. And I've heard of that. I've not, I've it? not played it, but I have heard of that. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's for narrator and band. That's a great piece. Oh, cool. Um, I had I had one final thought, and then I want to be open to anything else that you want to discuss here as well. There's sure. another wrote that a piece that I wrote that said, um, if a piece doesn't, if a piece needs to be altered in some small way within composer intent, including fixing instrumentation issues, then you can still do the piece. Absolutely. Now, I I think so often we say, okay, well, there's a big alto solo in this. I don't have a good alto player, I, mm-hmm. or there's a huge oboe solo. We don't have an oboe player. Right. Well, if take that away, is the piece good for your group? Okay, then put it in the trumpet with a straight mute and call it good or something like that. Now, that's different from saying this is like the Incredibles. I'll use a pop thing, the Incredibles. And it has to be like a really cool alto solo. Mm. Like, okay, if you don't have somebody who can do that, don't do the piece. Right. So there's a fine line between being willing to alter the piece in some small way through Spalius or Finale or a friend. Mm. Um, So I assume as a composer, you know, there's a fine line between sticking to the intent of your music yeah, you know, I, I would agree. That, but one of the things that David taught me that that I've always held close to my heart, you know, I've been blessed here. I've always had full double reads. I've always had all of the instrumentation that I need. So I've not had to alter that here. But however, when I was a high school teacher, I often did that. In fact, uh, my, my first teaching position, um, the instrumentation was very unbalanced. And I had to basically rearrange everything we played. Um, But what David taught me is that good music will survive changes in orchestration. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the composer's sounds that that we hear in our heads when we're writing it might not be exactly what we've heard. But artistically, you can still use that music in a great way and be effective with it. Um, I also agree with your point, though, that if it's something that is... um, you know, would, would drastically change the music, like your example of, you know, the, the sax solo in The Incredibles, then yeah, that's my, something you might want to avoid. Uh, you know, most often, though, what we run into is bands that don't have a strong section somewhere, or, um, you know, even more often than that are bands that don't have double reads, um, you know, or, or you don't have enough of them to run a contrabassoon and a mm-hmm. contrabassoon clarinet at the same time or what have you, you can still survive that. There are ways, and that's the reason I am adamant that um, in music ed curriculum that the orchestration class is one of the most important classes that our, our music ed folks take because they're going to get out into schools and have to deal with these, but they can still play great literature. You just have to spend some time adjusting that for your group. A couple of current things that I'm going through. I have one of my groups you're not even going to believe this. There isn't a tenor saxophone player. It's really? like, how often do you not have it? It's just the way that it's worked right. out. There's no tenor player, but I have more than enough euphoniums that are great. And guess what? One of them reads trouble clef. So right. on this piece, this kid's playing tenor saxophone. It's just straight over to it. And it works wonderful. I also have in this group, a smaller low section, mm-hmm. but then in, in addition to switching some kids over, um, fell into my lap, two very nice boys who play upright bass. Okay, well, here, you know, so I'm writing tons of string bass parts mm-hmm. just to help help fill that out. Um, I did want to mention one more piece that came to mind. Um, I forget the arranger. It might be Longfield, but it's a grade two piece mm-hmm. called Gabriel's Oboe. Yes, I'm familiar yeah. with that. Gabriel's Oboe. And I say that especially for our high school or middle school teachers because it's a, literally a grade two. I mean, it stays, I think, within the B-flat concert scale and it's half notes. But you, if you have that one outstanding student, I think it comes with like three different transpositions of the part, but mm. you could put it in for, we've, I've done it with tuba, we've done it with oboe, we've done it with vibraphone. If you have like so many middle schools, right? You have like, my band is here, right. but then I have this one player who is like really stellar. Oh, yeah, yeah, yep. This arrangement of Gabriel's oboe is something they should check out. Really yeah. Cool. And what a, what an awesome opportunity. You know, we, we do that here. Whenever I go on tour, normally I will feature... Uh, at least one or two of our students in in solo repertoire mm-hmm. uh, in order to put them in front of the band. You know, so often at the collegiate level, we see our applied faculty soloing with our wind ensembles and stuff, which of course is great. I do that as well. But giving that really, really advanced student uh, a chance to play a solo with the band um, is motivating not only to them, but those players that are in the ensemble thinking, hey, that could be me sometime. Mm-hmm. So as someone who's taught at the the uh, secondary school level and the high and the college level as well. Is there, I'm told by friends who teach in the college level that there's more in common than we think. Oh yeah. Um, especially 
when you're talking about um, smaller programs like my own here, and I mean, I, I call it a smaller program, although I'm lucky to have, you know, I have full instrumentation, well-balanced groups, but um, yeah, there's, there's a lot in common. Um, I, we, we, we musically do much of the same thing. I mean, we're, we're teaching our students how to become better musicians, um, you know, and really to me, what we do, whether it be collegiate level, high school level, middle school level, it doesn't matter. What we're really doing is we're using music as the vehicle to change lives. Mm -hmm. um, my, as I mentioned here, most of my premier group is not music majors, but I'm working with them on music and working with them on being able to emote through their music, and that affects everything else in their life, and it will make their lives richer as they move forward. Many of my musicians, when they've graduated here, go on and still continue to play in a community band or play in church or various different things like that. And, uh, and I think that's really what the bottom line is. And that's what high school directors are doing as well. That's what middle school directors, I think all of us, I would hope anyway that if you ask any band director, you know, what their, their number one hope for their students is, I, I would hope that they would say that they continue to enjoy playing their instrument for the rest of their lives. Um, and and that's, I think that's, that's where the similarities begin and they just continue from there. And another piece of that, um, if people know about the Fire Robin method um, of general mm -hmm. music, the, their, what we believe in is the raising humans who are tuneful, beatful, and artful so that they can continue that in their next generation, even down to right. maybe I'm not a musician, but I'm going to be singing to my child and trying to get them to sleep, and I better use a good singing voice. In Absolutely. Order to do that. Yeah, and uh, encouraging them to, to use, use that to, to fulfill, you know, in order to enhance their, their enjoyment of their lives as well. Yeah, so I'd like to end with, um, I know we, we started the podcast about the piece that you're working on that's a, mm -hmm. a new commission. Um, any else, anything else coming up, either personally or for the field or anything that you're excited about? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky that I get to wear two hats. I get to be a band director, an orchestra director, and I also get to be a composer. Um, you know, I've just recently finished uh, what, what was kind of a, a monumental piece for me, um, I wrote a, a new short 90 second work for uh, the Marine bands in both Paris Island and San Diego that um, they will now play for this plan for eternity for whenever uh, new Marines graduate from boot camp. It's just called dismissed because that's the last command that uh, the drill wow. instructors give them at the end. Um, so I'm really, really proud of that. It's, it's not, you know, musically, it's not the hardest piece I've written. It's not the most artistic, but it is functionally a really cool fanfare type piece of music that being a former Marine and still being able to have that connection with the, uh, with uh, Marine music was incredibly special to me. Um, and I was able to tune into both live streams on uh, January 6th when both bands on each coast, only three hours apart, debuted the, the piece. Um, other than that, um, you know, within my work here at Dort, um, we're leaving to go on tour on the March the 4th this year. Um, we're going to tour for a few days and then make our, our way back to Sioux Center, and we're recording a new CD. Hmm. Um, the title of our album will be uh, uh, Patchwork. Um, I, I got that from the fact that the music is is kind of a patchwork of, of these things we've been talking about. Old, new, borrowed, blue, and there will be a march on there as well. Chimes of hmm. Liberty will be the march on this recording. The last CD we recorded was all new music. And this year I wanted to, to stray away and do, do something that was uh, from all different genres. Holt C Flat Suite will be on there. Um, I've got a new piece that I wrote just this past summer for a group in Indiana called Rio's Rainbow that we'll record. And there's just a, a great list of, of music that I think will be uh, hopefully be a good reference recording for band directors to, uh, going into the future, as well as uh, something for our students here to be very proud of for the rest of their lives that they were able to produce something at that level. Um, and then we'll tour some more and then... Uh, luckily, on the composer side, I have got a uh, couple of compositions planned for this summer. I'm actually working on one right now for Wilmington High School in Ohio um, that will com help them commemorate their, I think, I believe it's the 150th um, anniversary of their school. Wow. Um, and then I have a commission with a community band in Indiana um, that I don't want to say too much about because it's it's a surprise for someone. Hmm. So I don't want to get too much information out there, but I'm really excited about that. And actually, one of the things in the the distant future that I'm, I'm really excited about is I'm beginning to talk to a few people about my second symphony. Um, I've had in mind for a couple of years now, I felt like it's been on my heart that um, I feel led to, to write a symphony that orally 
relays the story of uh, Revelation, the final book of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And of course, all of us, when we look at that, uh, there can be some scary things in reading that. There can be, uh, you know, it, it, the imagery within that, that book of the Bible is, is truly incredible. And uh, I think it lends itself very well to storytelling. You know, I'm kind of thinking about uh, along the lines of like Mackey's Wine Dark Sea and things like that, but only in relation to the story of Revelation. So, so yeah, I mean, if anybody's interested in that, they can drop me an email because I'd love to. I'd love to have as many people that are, that are interested to uh, to get in on that whenever we decide to to kick it off. So, speaking of that, how would you prefer people contact you if they're looking to reach out? Um, the, the the best way to contact me is via email. Uh, my email is onsby.rose at dort.edu, and I, I'll spell that because my name is so weird, and, and dort's not an easy word either. It's O-N-S as in Sam, B as in boy, Y, dot R-O-S-E, just like the flower, at D as in dog, O, R as in Romeo, D as in dog, T, dot edu. And they could always reach out on growingband.com, and I'd put them in touch Absolutely. with you as well. So. And anyone that knows me, even remotely, knows that I am uh, walking, talking Mr. Facebook on uh, social media. I, I really enjoy keeping up with people that way. So um, Facebook is a great way to reach out as well. I, I regularly uh, uh, talk with people there. Well, Lonsby, thanks for making the time. I really appreciate uh, yeah. you putting this in your schedule. Not a problem at all, Kyle. I, I really enjoyed this. This has been a lot of fun. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to the Growing Band Director. See you next week.